Welcome, colleagues, fellow citizens. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a roundtable discussion entitled Youth and Democracy, which is a very broad uh, sort of description, but I'm sure we're going to get to the specifics of that later. I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves. Um, starting with myself, because I want to do a bit of a, a marketing thing. So I, I'm Bruce Kadali from the Institute for African Alternatives, which is a which is a research-based uh, social, uh, political, and economic um, institute. Uh, we're very proud to to uh, enter into a partnership with Cornerstone for the Critical Dialogues, and this is this is the first in a pilot series that we hope to be having over over the next year. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask everybody to just introduce themselves, starting with Cecilia, and uh, then I'll, I'll open up with a, with a remark or two and then get the conversation going. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mkuseli Madiba, all the way from Ekailicha. I am a program officer for FSS Core Plan, uh, based in the East, East London. Uh, we are working with uh, active citizenry, you know, uh, service delivery, and also especially now with, after COVID with the uh, informal settlement. I have 15 years experience in community development. I am an alumni, graduated here last year uh, with my BA honors in community development. I started a active citizenry uh, society at Cornerstone. But in general, I've been involved in youth development and uh, community participation, making local government work. I've worked across uh, South Africa, different uh, communities, and also in other countries abroad. Uh, and um, it's a privilege to be here as a young person. And yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, it's quite intimidating to go up after that. <laughs> uh, my name is Jordan Peters. Um, and I am also involved, I would say, in community and youth development. I work with an organization called We'll Do It Ourselves. Um, and the idea behind I do it, We'll Do It Ourselves is somewhat cynical. Um, but I think we as young people have come to the conclusion that if we are to have change in our communities, in our society, um, we can no longer wait for the government. We can no longer wait for older generations. Um, we can't wait for the corporate sector. So if we are to have true and fundamental change in our communities, we'll have to do it ourselves. But this is often not as easy as it sounds, um, especially when the intergenerational um, knowledge um, kind of... I would say, staircase has been broken, right? Um, and after 1994, many activists just kind of got on with their corporate jobs, they got on with their very fancy NGO jobs, and so that knowledge chain was just broken. So many of us young activists and people who are interested in changing our communities actually don't know how, you know? And so We'll Do It Ourselves aims to kind of bridge that gap by giving young people the tools and the resources to effect change in the communities that they come from. Um, I also work with the District 6 Museum and um, history is also a very fundamental part of my activism because I feel that in order to actually change our communities, we first need to understand what has happened in our communities. And we see that the education system, um, our parents are not reliable um, sources of knowledge, um, especially in our, in our very recent history. I'm not even talking about slavery and colonialism in South Africa. Um, so history is the tool that we need to use to understand understand the true solutions to the issues we face in our communities. Um, yeah, that's me. Okay. My name is Inga Shweni. I'm from Nyanga. And I'm also a, a, a young activist and a change maker in my community. I also work with the SG Young Activist from Rone Bosch. We specialize on, on solving conflicts around our schools and our areas. And I'm also a... a I can say maybe a land under the banner of the Pan Africanist Congress of Azania, which is the PAC, as we know. So uh, I, I think I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Michael Hendrickson, I'm the Provincial Electoral Officer of the Independent Electoral uh, Commission. Um, I was appointed in this post last year, uh, but I've been around with, with the Electoral Commission before. I'm a lawyer by, by profession, and in that uh, served in, in, in different capacities um, in, in, in that regard. Um, the IEC takes its mandate of electoral democracy very seriously. Um, and, and obviously, as much as the Commission can put in place all the mechanisms for people to vote, the, the challenge, however, is to, to get people to, to want to vote. 
Uh, and, and I think that is a challenge within our, our broader society as we face challenges of unemployment, of poverty, uh, of immense equality. Uh, you know, you have the twin evils, if you want to put it like that. You have the lingering uh, um, legacy of, of apartheid, and then uh, linked to that, you have the, the ongoing corruption and, and the failure to deliver services. So within that context, how do you get people to say, but I want to participate uh, um, when they look around them? So th that is, I think, the, the biggest challenge for, for us as the IEC is to get involved um, in that dialogue, in, in, in the different platforms to engage and say, how do we get, how do we start saying to people uh, to participate and, and actually see uh, um, the change that can happen? Um, I think that is, good. that is the, going to be the biggest challenge that we face as, as a young democracy, um, that we, we sit with this particular path and say, where do we go to? Um, there's different types of democracy. Um, yes, one of it is voting. That's your representative uh, democracy. But there's so much more to democracy. There's your participative democracy. It's about getting involved, whether it's in ward committees and when, when uh, legislation is published, getting involved. Uh, 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 um, in, in these matters as well. There's your direct democracy, and, and some would say our social media is now lately the most uh, um, democratic way of, of expression, because that is the uh, direct uh, democracy. Um, but I look forward to, to engaging with, with uh, um, the panelists on, on these matters. Yeah, um, firstly, thank you for having me. My name is Jason Hotzenberg. I also work with uh, the Institute for African Alternatives specifically with creating platforms for young people to engage in social and political uh, discourse. Um, but more generally, my interests are like anything like arts and culture and also activism and education methodologies. Uh, so I, I kind of, I shy away from like giving myself a description. I, I think I just like float in these different spaces that interest me and then, you know, use inspiration from these different places to come up with ideas. And um, yeah, I, th I think of myself as like a curator, a designer, and like the apparatus being culture and, you know, me designing from my specific positionality and networks that I access. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I think that these introductions are already um, framing a sort of a direction to this to this conversation. So youth and democracy, um, I think that's a very broad, you know, a, a category. We, we 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 I think we are, we we are looking here at questions of active participation, what it means to be a citizen, um, uh, what it and, and and as Michael uh, so pointed out that it's more than just voting. Um, the information that we have historically is, is that young people in the, in the youth demographic drive social change, that uh, where, where there's been significant uh, or, uh, transformation, change, political change, that, that young people have been the, the drivers of it. Uh, we're talking about people under the age of 30. Um, or, or, you know, there's some dispute as to, you know, what a young person is uh, anyway, age-wise. Um, uh, two examples recently, just, just now in Colombia, a, an election uh, uh, which, which had a huge young people turnout. So Colombia get its first uh, left-wing government in, in its post-colonial history. Uh, just a year before that, Zambia also had a 70, in Africa, 70% turnout in their elections, also uh, with a large number of young people going to the voting stations. Yet the overall picture is negative. We know um, in Africa, participation is low, voter turnouts are low and declining. South Africa has, has demonstrated this, this pattern in both national and local elections. Um, so, yes, we're speaking about active citizenship. It's more than just voting. Voting is one element of it. Um, but we do want to come to grips with, you, you know, what, what are the obstacles, what is causing this declining rate of participation. I think Jordan touched on something in her introduction. So I think, um, you know, th those are the questions. I did my own desktop, you know, dot <laughs> research in preparation for this, but I'm going to leave that alone and get this conversation going. And I wonder if you all agree that we start with Michael. Um, because to give us that perspective of of of, of what what 
you know, they've encountered. I mean, we know, we know for instance, um, there was that XA campaign in, in, in 2019, was it? Yeah. Which had a lot of money thrown at specifically targeting youth and voting. Yeah. Um, yet, it's, yet in the end, we still saw a decline in, in, in figures and participation. So maybe that's the point of departure. You know, thanks very much, uh, Bruce. I, I think just overall, just in a bit of a couple of stats, um, within, within the Western Cape, because I'll, I'll just speak for that, um, we have just over 3.11 million voters. And of that, if, if you look at the, the sort of age breakdown, I think just over 14% are of those registered voters are between the ages of 18 and 30. So that's very low, comparatively, uh, given the fact of how many young people we have. Um, so that is obviously the first challenge that, that you face, because even before you can even get to voting, you need to be registered. Um, you know, you cannot actually really be saying, I'm going to make a choice to vote or not. Uh, you can only make that cho choice once you are actually registered. And, and um, therefore, then li uh, lies the rub. For example, we started online registration now because we told, we're told young people would be more keen to do online registration. So we, we make that facility. But as much as we do that, and we have 1,577 stations around the province that we open, and yet with all of that, the issue is not so much about the administration part, that we're putting uh, um, these mechanisms out there. The challenge is saying, but so why are young people not coming forward? And I think that I can only ask the, ask the question, but I cannot give the answer. Because I think amongst the young people, um, they, they will provide the answer to us. Because too often, you know, I sit in my little office and I think of schemes that I can do. How do I'm going to entice young people this and how can we do that? And, and, and really, I'm not the person uh, to be, uh, um, to be uh, sort of doing that because I, I think young people will, will provide us with the answers if we, if we listen. If we listen, I think, uh, one, can I just, another little bugbear of mine eh, is, is, is a statement that says youth are uh, apathetic, the apathy is, apathy means in its root uh, with no feeling, no concern. I don't think that is the issue of young people. Young people have very much interest in what is happening around us as a, as a society, as a community, rather than saying that you are, you're not apath apathetic around the issues, but it's about the system. What is it that people are looking and saying, is there real value in that participation? Um, we had in the last, uh, the local government elections, um, over 12,000 candidates in the different wards, etc. cetera, yeah? And of those uh, 909, I think, were under the age of 30. Now, that's a good thing because young people are participating. Uh, but then the next question I ask is, so where were they in the pecking order? Remember, we have, a, we have a, a PR system, so you'll have your number one candidate and working down, working down. So it's good if you have a lot of young people on your, on your PR list, but if they're so low down that they, they have a snowball's chance of, of even getting in uh, and making a difference, I think. So all these sort of things are combined. And, and what I'm saying is that there's a lot of role players out there that have to take this co-responsibility to them. You know, people look at the IEC and say, yeah, what is the IEC doing? But when a lot of it is to do with what people's real experience of government is, and that turns you away. Not the fact that you vote, but what has been your experience of service delivery? And how is that impacting on you and saying, why must I bother? Will I make a difference? Those are the questions that, that, that are asked. And, and the second part of this whole issue of apathy is alienation. Then to what extent does the processes and systems alienate young people from participating? Um, whether it's in our deposits, whether it's the way we structured ourselves, very formalistic. I, I don't know. Uh, um, but yeah, I think that is some of the challenge that we face as IEC. Um, so far, we've, we've visited about 121 schools in the province so far in, in, in this year, um, just to do boat education. And, but you're getting the message there, but it's what do you do and, and how people's lived experience. Because I can do all the boat education I want to, but if your lived experience is, is something else and something different, um, how, do we, how, do we, how do we overcome that? Thanks, Michael. So, so there is this um, stat that um, while 70% of the people, the, the African population on the entire continent are under the age of 30, only I think 2.2% are in political representation. 
well, our, our political representatives are in, in, in legislatures, parliaments, so on and so forth. So, you know, I think for us here is, is to, to learn from these young people and to tease out what, what, what's going on. So I'm going to open the, the floor to, you know, the table, sorry, the table. Um, so I think, you know, when I was thinking of coming here, I thought of myself, you know what, rather than speaking from the head, let me speak about my lived uh, reality. And, and also having been an IEC observer uh, in a local election, I think there are some parts where it's true and then it's untrue. So the first one is that young people don't, in most cases, they don't want to be involved in politics, right? And then they can't separate between the politics with the capital letter and politics with a small letter. You know, we speak about the political party. Mm. This is where now we get into the ANC, DA, et cetera. And lived realities, I saw my mom saying, oh, we're going to go vote uh, ANC, but then situations are still the same. So as a young person growing up, I'm like, ah, man, politics, you know, ah, is nothing. I'm not going to vote. And to be honest, when I turned 18, I, I didn't vote for the first time which is not good right now. I regret that right now. But now growing up, I'm not in a political part, but I'm involved in politics. Things are, you know, education, whatever I'm involved. Now I started to get involved in life skills. Then you get to be taught these things. Okay, I'm, I wanna get involved. I wanna make a difference, right? Now I get into politics, I see uh, making local government work, you know, learning what is that the different, you know, sub council, what council, that's politics now. You understand me getting to understand that and now transferring that into the community. Now you get into the community now, again, there's politics. You've got national, you've got provincial, you've got local, right? As a young person, you're trying to involve, but there's these politics. I hear the, the, the number 121 schools, where in which demarcation are they, right? Are we, for example, I know that in my community, the IEC representative that you see that are still making people vote are those that were 10 years back still the same people that are making you vote, go, go, cool, and all of that. And you ask yourself, where's the young person? Now, I work in schools. I've never seen a voter education in school. I've never seen it. I'm, and I, I, I've never seen it. And my question is that, no, man, these people don't want young people to vote, actually, because we know that youth are the influence and the power. For example, we have a subculture now that has grown to the world stage. I'm a piano. And I make example of this. Ama Piano started as something in the township. It's now a global genre by young people in South Africa. We've got Trevor Noah in the big stage. So young people do have the power to influence these structures and things. But I just feel that your IEC, your political parties, all these structures, they don't want us to be informed because they know when we get involved, we shift things. Gamba Youth is here. We've known people that have come through Gamba Youth, We've got equal education. Young structures do work. You understand, young structures are there. I just feel like your IEC, your uh, political parties and these structures, they don't want, if you go to a what committee, what committee at the local level, there's no young person. There's no young person. Last election, there was no young person in my community. I was like, are you voting? No, I'm not voting. We can have a, a platform of online, but how do we engage with that platform? Are we speaking the language that young people will with? Then let's come to another skeleton, which is the civic society. That's another skeleton on its own, because you would have the IEC, like you said, there are role players that are given this money so that they can assist with voter education, but we know what is happening to our civic society right now. It has turned certain corporate status quo. It, you know, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. You go to a hall, you get how many children are in Google it, voter education, you get to a hall, small children. No voter education, I'm not there, no one is there. So we, I, I feel like these structures are not speaking to us, but in paper, they say they are, but I don't think they are speaking to us. So I think that's my input for now. Um, if I can actually add on to that, um, I agree with basically almost everything that you said, um, but I think we need to, Outside of just talking about voting, we need to talk about this democracy, right? Or that the concept of a democracy and how young people view our democracy. Because I can, I mean, you can have, firstly, I had a lot of problems with the IEC's um, uh, campaign. Um, and I agree that, you know, you can say on paper that we've done this, we put this amount of money into it. But when I shared the online registration on my social media, a lot of people 
a lot of people, you know, even send me screenshots to say I, I registered to vote. So if I can do that as an individual with no money, um, and no resources, and then the IEC is struggling to do that. It's difficult to believe, right? But anyway, going back to my point about democracy, so when you go to young people, and I'm just echoing some of the things that you said as well, when you actually engage young people and you ask them, and I mean, I had a lot of these type of conversations as well. Why aren't you voting? Are you registered to vote? And then people are like, why? What is it going to do? What is it going to change in my life? What's it going to change in my community? Can this democracy feed me? Can it clothe me? Can it shelter me? Can it educate me? Um, because up until now, since 1994, and I mean, we're born freeze, right? I, I don't know everyone's ages, but I was born in 1997. And since then, what has this democracy, outside of, you know, us being able to now access formerly white schools, formerly white beaches, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of the socioeconomic reality of our people, what has this democracy actually really given us? Then I want to quickly just go to your point about political parties, right? Because that's also a very interesting thing. So I actually, I don't know who else belongs to a political party. I belong to a political party. Um, and the reason for that is because as much as I don't believe in this democracy that we supposedly have, I still believe that it's our only real, um, it's our only real, uh, I would say road to actually participating in this, um, in this government that we have. So I vote, I've always voted and I belong to a political party. But when you look at how young people view political parties, you realize that they don't know the policies of the political parties. They don't know what these political parties actually stand for, what they do. All they know is what they get from social media. So what is the next scandal? What politician has said something provocative or racist? Um, what political party has gone forward with a court case? What is the court case even about? We don't know, but we get these little like bite-sized headlines on social media or in the media. So even when we do engage as young people with political parties, it's not from an actual substantive point of view. It's very, very superficial. And then secondly, I think another thing that leads to the disillusionment is that when you actually see young political, uh, when you see young people enter political spaces, they literally just copy the the behaviors of their older counterparts. And I, I mean, I'm in the EFF, right? I've been with the EFF since fees must fall because the EFF actually provided us with legal resources and support during that time period. Um, and so a lot of us joined the EFF from Fees Must Fall. And when I say that I've been in branch meetings and I'm sitting like this and everyone in that room is under the age of 35, but they are literally having the same factional disputes, the same power hungry grabs that literally happen on the national and the provincial. Um, and I'm just sitting there and I'm thinking to myself like, why are, why are any of you here? It's, it's, it's all, it's all career opportunism. And so <clears throat> I think that's another thing that adds to the disillusionment is that people don't get involved in politics because they actually want to, um, you know, be change makers, right? They get involved in politics because they want the salary that comes with being in parliament, right? And all the different perks associated with us. Most young people who are actually invested, um, like us sitting at this table, um, we work with organizations outside of the political sphere and we have to fight for resources. You know, like oftentimes we have events and, and I mean, we, we don't get paid to be there. You know, there are, there are people in their fifties and their sixties who get very big salaries every month. Um, to, to talk about these things, to, to, to work in the IEC, no offense. Um, and then us as young people are literally having to work in corporate jobs. Like I, I, I had to leave my corporate job to come here. Um, and now I have to go back again afterwards because I, I have to pay my rent. And there's no other access, um, to this political system but by being outside of it. Um, so yeah, I think, we need to talk about democracy first before we talk about voting. And then secondly, like what is young people's understanding of the political system? Because I think that also informs why they don't participate. Uh, but yeah, that's... Thanks. I mean, I, I think I think let's you know, <laughs> there's a lot uh, coming out of this and I, I think I'd, I'd like to just pursue the round table and, and have everybody. Yeah. <coughs> um... Just to touch and. briefly on some of the points that were made, like firstly with lived experience, I think lots of people, including myself, don't experience like 
the actual effects of politics to, you know, changing material circumstances. So like the experience that you were talking about, like your parents are voting or you see people voting, lining up, or when it comes that time of the year that, you know, these political parties are handing out soccer balls and cool drinks. Um, but then after that, there's not much tangible feeling that, you know, things have changed. And then growing up, seeing that you kind of become disillusioned with anything political uh, because you, we just feel that it doesn't lead to any real change. But then also the lack of education, I think, with like within schools or um, just within our communities, giving, you know, context for why political participation is important and um, the role, you know, that we could play and, and just like having an ongoing education and, and kind of empowering young people with not only understanding the political landscape, but actually feeling like they, you know, are able to participate and change the political landscape. And then because of that lack of education, um, I feel like there's the subcultures, you know, these subcultures that you speak of, like I'm a piano and then that like um, branches out or is, you know, it's an ecosystem of not only music, but like fashion and, and you know, just all sorts of artistic ideas and expression where our whole like Pan-African network has actually been built and diaspora poor, I don't know, diasporic, you know, but like a whole pan-African network and around the diaspora as well has been built like within the African youth, um, you know, around like street culture and, and arts. And I think what is happening is like people or lots of people within this specific subculture, at least people like are using expression and arts to express their agency because they don't like feel that there's any political room for them or you know they, they don't take an interest or have become disillusioned with politics so there's so i do think like that you know these networks and movements are powerful and you know it's like, capable of changing like whole cultures and in fact like it is changing culture um and so I, I think maybe if we can like create ways for not only like youth to be educated on, again, like the political landscape and the importance of participation, but actually like cultivate a space where, you know, we start like handing down like the responsibilities and, and, and the um, platforms, you know, for young people to recreate this entire space and like use their power. Um, to create the system that they actually want, you know, but that comes with feeling like a sense of belonging and a sense of like, do we even want this political system? Do we even want the government as it is, you know? But I do think empowerment and like political education is important, but we have to let like the youth determine, um, not only participate in voting, but actually determine like, the structures, you know, through which they participate in politics. So in, in the terms of getting youth participation, as is he, already said, in voting, so I think the IEC need to play a role whereby they get on the ground and mobilize youngsters that voting, like, and, and teaching them more that voting is like, is whereby they can be able to get their voices heard up. So by voting, it, it, it means that they, they, they able to choose the, 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 the leader of their own good. So youth can play a role whereby they able to, to, to renew, to maintain, and youth can able to, to, to establish a current status on our society, including leadership skills and innovation skills. As the youth, we can be able to bring up current issues and perspectives in the international public affairs arena. Thanks, thanks. Um, you know, a lot has, has been said just in this in this one round, and I just want to just add add a little, you know, just 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 uh, pull something out without addressing or, or in, in in any way attempting to address all the issues brought up. But on the one hand, I think what comes out of just this whole 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 round here is is that. There's, there's a feeling that apathy or lack of 
knowledge or education is not sufficient to explain this disaffection with political participation, with with being you know active an active citizen in in in, in democratic processes. It's issue driven. Young, I think that's sort of what's coming out here on 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 that level. It's 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 driven by issues. It's driven by material issues. It's driven by feeling that systemic exclusion, that the spaces uh, are not are not there, but there's an active component to it. That the spaces are in fact being denied. You know, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a political feeling I get out of that. That there's an active component of of that. You know, and that that, and on the other hand, um, well, you know, there was a, there's a lot of referral here to to a, a, a potentially gerontocratic society, a society that is not feeling its young people, and that that is an active thing which is 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 partially political, if I may say so might have cultural components to it? I think um, maybe, you know, it's like rooted in the education system also and then like thinking back to like Bantu Education Act and Colored Persons Education Act, all these things which were solely instituted to train black and POC to, you know, become part of the labor force so it wasn't really to, you know, get them participating in the culture and in the political sphere. And so maybe we still have like, you know, the legacies of that where our education isn't geared towards actually giving us the context and empowering us with the knowledge of history and, um, you know, the sense of like restoring or restorative justice. It's just kind of continued from this as this purpose of like, creating a labor force and a more skilled labor force where maybe back then it was just, you know, like um, mine workers or whatever, but now you can have, I don't know, just more skilled black PLC workers and create this black middle class so that we can assimilate into the culture. Um, but there's no real like acknowledgement or, or, or the purpose I think maybe of, of our education needs to be shifted and and you know, geared towards political participation, and maybe there's a fear around that because if the youth, you know, because many young people do become disillusioned with the system, like through the experience of school, um, and 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 so then that just like shapes their whole understanding of society and like the systems in society, and that's kind of what drove the like Soweto up rising as well was the disillusionment with the school system and their poor education. So maybe there is an element of fear, you know, of what would happen if the youth were like conscientized and aware of the, how education is actually continuing to exploit and oppress them. And yeah, so maybe maybe think like rethinking the role of education specifically in like a post-apartheid South Africa is what's necessary instead of like filtering by like a political, you know, voter education once a month or what like the whole system should be that, you know, like yeah. participation and yeah. yeah. If I can maybe echo some of what Jason was saying, um, but maybe from like a bit of a different standpoint, but I think what the apartheid government did really well um, was create like this paternalistic <laughs> relationship between the government and society, right? And we see that in the way the apartheid government, well, I mean, you guys were there, maybe you guys could <laughs> speak on this more than I can, but in, in, in the sense of being in control of almost every facet of black people's lives, right? Um, from where you live, to where you work, to your level of education, to how much you were paid, to, um, your movement, right? So, and then we saw this, you know, in the 80s, in the 70s, well, in the 60s as well, this, this, this mass movement starts arising, you know, people are taking control of their communities. Uh, we saw the school boycotts, rent boycotts, bus boycotts, you know, so there was this, this almost this, um, this shifting, um, I would say power moving away from this government and moving into our communities. 
But then, in 1994, or even before that, the ANC, and I think maybe that's also something that we're missing from this conversation. We're talking about very broad topics, but there are specific culprits. And I feel like the ANC demobilized all of those community-led movements or those community-led, um, I would say, centers of agency, right? Where communities were deciding what happened in those communities. And now we kind of have gone back to this paternalistic idea of of government where um and obviously uh, the government is meant to do certain things um they are the administrators of this country but everything that's wrong in our society we're like okay the government needs to fix this and they do need to fix this but what do we do when they don't you know do we just wait do we just like and i mean i'm i i'm i feel like i always say i'm a veteran of protesting i'm, I'm tired of walking to parliament and then giving over like a letter and then nothing happens and we must go again next year but like what do we do when the government doesn't fulfill its mandate we need to find a different way to to think about how we take back our agency in our communities and maybe that is also how we get to as jason said like a point where young people actually feel invested or feel that they their opinions matter because I think that's also the thing when you go to a young person you ask them why they don't vote or or you ask them what their political opinion is on something or an issue right a lot of times the first time someone has asked them that or it's the first time someone has gone up to them like what do you think about this thing um because people don't care what young people think in communities that is very true and then June comes around every year and it's like, oh, the youth, oh, the youth must lead, the youth must do this, the youth must save the country. And then for the rest of the year, it's like the youth doesn't exist, except when the unemployment stats come, it's like, oh my God, the youth is not working. Um, but outside of that, um, we, we have like these little representatives um, on a council, there's one young person um, who's... Uh, most of the time uh, also a career opportunist right um so i think it's like also a like getting back that agency in our communities where we actually need to be responsible for what happens in our communities but b also remembering that like the way our society is currently set up is that young people are not asked what they what they think um unless in very specific circumstances such as such as this yeah, I, I, I think also that one thing I'd like to touch on is, and, and it's, there, there, there's almost like a, a, a co-responsibility here. You know, don't just rely on government, don't just rely on, you know, whether it's a, a faith-based organization. There's a co-responsibility within our own spheres of influence for us to actually start that conversation, to start that change. Um, don't wait for somebody to ask me what's my opinion, tell people what is my opinion. Um, and I think uh, part of the, the challenge that we face here in, as a democracy is, what is the alternative to it? We, we, we put up uh, structures there. We have political parties, have youth structures. So why, why is this conversation within political parties not taking place? For example, the issue driven. Uh, you will find, you for example said that there were large turnouts in, in, in certain parts of, of the world on particular issues when it, when, when there was a critical issue at stake. People did come out because they then could, could, could uh, um, um, deal with that particular issue. But you know, un unless we actually all come together and actually start saying, I mean, I will not be able to go to all the schools. So don't expect me to go to every school and do it. I just, I don't have that. So I need, I need to be looking at who's the partners that can do that. You know, I need to engage with the education department and say, so what is your curriculum? What, what, what space are you giving during, the, during school? For, for those discussions, or are we so worried about uh, uh, um, the specter of protest? that we do not really want to allow a discussion because it can so easily evolve into a protest by uh, 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 learners at a particular school. So you want to sort of say, Let, let's hold back on it. So I, I think at the end of the day, there is, that, there is a responsibility. I mean, we, within this country, we have a number of institutions even that are set up to, to, to assist young people. You know, what is their return on investment, if you want to put it that way, other than being as you say, corporatized into a particular position. Um, and I think that's the challenge of coming and, and holding ourselves accountable um, as much as, 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 as people look at the IEC and say, okay, vote education, but that's one small part of our, our bigger democracy. The issues that are facing our society is much more than just limiting it to an issue of a vote. Mm. There's, there's much more bigger systemic issues that we have to face. Those are the, the challenges and, and that's the, the, the platforms that we should be engaging on and saying, why is it? 
uh, that, for example, we're pushing on our political rights, but the socioeconomic is, is lagging behind. Um, all the time we, we, we deal with these particular matters. So um, it is a challenge, I think, that, that we need to get. And, and I mean, youth and democracy is synonymous. You, you just cannot, um, and, and as people transition from youth, you mentioned about, you know, you transition from being young into an age group, age out. Uh, what happens then? Uh, do, you, do you lose that, that where you come from because of age? So, Thanks. Before, Celia, I know you want to make a comment. I just want to pull some, some things that just came, came to mind out. Uh, um, you know, one is, is, you know, I'm thinking of that silence is, is violence slogan that's, that's, that's running around at the moment. But, but what I'm, uh, uh, an earlier converse, uh, uh, comment by Jordan that there is that break. And, and, and there's a lot of uh, talk coming out about this the intergenerational knowledge chain, that that conversation is missing. It's either systemically being, being suppressed or it's historically broken. Um, and, and then also another thing I want to pull out is, is this, this conflict between your, the benefits of exercising your democratic right to vote. I mean, for want of a, want of a better expression, we might be, be, be saying non-euphemistically, that we are paper democracy, we are democracy on paper. Because there's this tension between exercising your right to vote, what the benefits, what you see, see of that is, and protest as a means of change, violent protest as a means of change, forcing the system to, to, to listen uh, or to see you. Um, so, so those are the things that, 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 that come out to me here. I mean, I, I want to, before Mkususeli speaks, but, but if you can comment later, just reflect on when you as the IEC, you know, co consider all these factors, how do you review your practices? Is there, is there a way in which you review your practices towards how can we, you know, what did we do last, uh, you, know, how, you know, I'd like to get some insight on that, but I'm gonna give over to Mkususeli. Oh, thank you. Um... I think also not, so on a personal front, I think it's good that South Africa is a democratic country. Uh, yeah, that's my stance. I, I, I am someone that is pro the, our constitution. Um, I'm someone that believes even if it's in paper, but if we actually implement it, we have, so I'm, I'm pro that. And being pro that, also in a democratic country, you have democratic platforms, to exercise your democratic right, right? So in the local government, you would have system that says that an IDP, for example, five-year plan for the community, there should be an integrated development plan, community should come together and then say, these are our issues. And then in this, we would have a budget, this budget goes to provincial, provin then, you know. So there are democratic uh, processes. For example, I usually do, there's the, um, a site called South African something. So it always sends me um, articles of an amendment of uh, an act that is going on. Have your comment. So that's not a petition. So your comment counts as one. So if your comment is going to go to court, it's not gonna say, okay, it's a group. Again, that's another platform. You have petitions now. People are saying, okay, uh, sending, please sign this petition, for example. So at one point, I feel like democracy is there, there's processes that if, for example, Western Cape government, you have, if I wanted, yesterday I was sending an email to someone higher up, DSD. It's on the website. I took the email, I sent, I can even call them. You know, I can even email them, the mayor, you know, the council. So these things are also there. So I also want to say that. Then also as a young person, I also know myself, you know, I, I, my priorities are not the same. You know, when you are speaking about now I need to do this and all of that, because sometimes we are in the faces of young people with this information, but still the reaction is, is not there. So I also, I'm not even playing a blame game to say, okay, it's the IEC, is this, they are, right? So I just wanted to paint that. Then the second part uh, coming to you, I feel like there's this saying, but, uh, e, 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 before you know the truth, no, we are Zingam. It started with the seed, right? And I don't want to always be blaming ANC and saying this because Utatu Mandela, they did try. You know, when they introduced, they said, okay, we're coming back, we're gonna, what, what was it called? Remind me that the, the plan that was going to be used where the people were going to be put in the center of development. I forgot to you, must, um, what was it? RDP, 
there was the RPT, Reconstruction Development Plan. So there was the Reconstruction Development Plan that Mandela, they wanted it. They said the people will be put in, they need to be the self-agency. So the, there was the RTP centers. I know one still exists in Armanas, if you go there, where communities go there, they sow and et cetera. But now with the RTP plan, remember the world is changing, right? The RTP had to be put on the side because they're saying, where are you going to get money to just expense, expense? You needed economy, hence you came up with, there was gear, et cetera, all of those things now. Hence I'm saying, as much as our government that we have gained political party, but in terms of economic power, I don't think they really gained. Because at the end of the day, you want to invest in education, right? We want to put um, uh, democracy or history to be, you still need money. Our government, besides tax, they get money from somewhere. And if you have a funder that is giving you money, they also determine certain things that you can do and not do. So there is on a bigger scale and all of that. But I'm going to go back to saying there are institutions that are there. I was working for, um, um, with another guy, volunteering for making local government work. We targeted five sites, we said we we're gonna go. And I'm coming to the IEC right now to what I'm speaking about. We got to Langa. Langa, there was no one in the hall. We're here to tell people of how local government work, why you should, be. because things do there. I usually get calls from community members to say, look here, these people did not put what we said we put. I know the structures, I'm informed, right? So now we wanted to inform the community, train them. No one was there. IEC people, and I'm, 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 I'm sorry, hence I'm saying trickle down. IEC people, they were there with their tables late, chillax, nothing of urgency. We were the ones going door to door. They didn't come to the hall, right? Now we're going into them, sitting down. Now we see the issues. Hey, this rooftop is falling down. We didn't come for that, I see. I'm just saying not to say I see will go all over, but your personnels that are there on a demarcation, and I know it's politics. I, I, I really know this politics. It's not just the IEC, because now we have to deal who's sitting as the chairperson of the IEC, which political party do they belong to, what is their manifesto, what is their mandate of being deployed in this position, etc. I do agree with him to say we need education, and if it means that we need to go into schools as after skills, we need. We're sitting with, with Mr. IEC, and we can speak about this now. When I leave, will the provincial say, young man, we want to work with you? Young lady, they won't say that. <laughs> they will go back to the same people that they're using. But we, here we are, people with agency. But there's these things also red tape. Um, do you belong to organization? Oh, I need to go now, find out. I need to register my organization. And now I need to learn about how do you register. But here we are. We say we want to work. But then, status quo. We go with what we know. Comments? And Michael, I'm going to ask you to go to, to, to respond to my question earlier. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the one thing is that, that um, we also realise that, you know, you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same response and, and it's not actually going to lead. Um, yes, we, we have the challenge of, of engaging with, with and, and we will engage with whoever wants to engage with the IEC and partner with the IEC by all means. Um, we don't have a specific agenda that says we will only keep hiring the same people or, or, or have a particular uh, partial uh, to a particular uh, manifesto or something. In fact, that is uh, an anathema for, for us at the IEC. So the first part is to actually say, but how have we been doing things here? Um, and, and if it's not been working, why is it not working? I mean, we, we go out and we say we want to hire uh, voter education people. Okay, I said, why do we want to go out and, 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 and go out? We should be partnering with organizations who already have a footprint in those communities because now I'm trying to compete with you or to with whoever who's there already. How do, we, how do we find a common ground around that particular process? I mean, one of the things I, I now started doing now again is, for example, just with our chapter nines, you know, it's not just the IEC, it's the human rights. And I'm saying, guys, we, we, yeah, we, we're supposed to be doing the same thing of entrenching our democracy. Why are we not working together? You know, we, we, we're not sharing our, our information. We're not dealing with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the issues that we can do, but we're rather trying to compete because how we've all got a little APP that says how many events that you have? What, five, tick, 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 tick. 
I've done my job and I sit back and I say, well, five. Or, you know, you, you determine and say, okay, for every, for every 10 people you speak to, that's an event. Hello. How, you know, we become too uh, um, being counted, you know, I don't know what's the word. You know, we don't know, tick off and say, okay, we've achieved because according to our, our APP, so many things, we tick so many. And then you want to say, what impact have I made? And that's always very difficult to measure impact. Uh, um, yes, the, the people that give you the money want to sh you must show results, but it's very difficult to, to, to measure impact on democracy education, other than to say I've given the message and ultimately what that person does with that message, uh, whether they actually want to vote for a particular party or not, that is their choice at the end of the day. But we need to empower them to get to that stage of saying, now I have a choice. Without that, uh, uh, why, why do we do so? Um, that is one of the different approaches that, that we're having with regard to, uh, um, to, to our outreach program. And the, the other one is, is, is engaging with, with the education department to say, you know, it's, it's nice to have that I can come to a school, but which school is it going to be? It's going to be the one in the community that I always go to. And I'm not going to a lot of other schools because I'm not being invited to that school for whatever reason. So why must I wait for the invitation? I mean, we are a state institution. We should be able to be put going into all the schools around uh, um, this province, for example, uh, and not sort of say, okay, we only go to traditional uh, schools where we know we use them as a station, we use them, this, uh, and now we build a relationship. And that's also part of the challenge that we face uh, um, in this province is to say, how do you get that institutional buy-in into the processes that, that, that we have? Um, otherwise, you, 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 you're just dealing with ad hoc -ish events every year and uh, uh, now and then. And that is not sustainable. Um, you, you need to build a sustainable uh, intervention. Um, uh, can I ask okay. a question yes, um, based upon what you're saying? But I think it's a bit more directed. So I think, you know, we've established um, that the reasons why young people don't vote, the reasons why their disillusion is quite layered and there's, there's various sources. My question to you is 2024 is coming up and some say it's the most important election since 94, right? Um, what is the IEC planning to do to get young people to vote? Outside of, you know, going to schools and... I, I feel like it's, a, we need a, a, a lot more of a substantive plan. So is there such a plan in existence? And, and if not, um, I mean, it's 2022 now. Um, what are you guys planning on, on... How are you planning on moving forward? Mm. Well, look, the first one is, is to, to, to ensure, as I said, the one is to have a more institutional-based uh, 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 intervention rather than ad hoc -ish. And that's the one thing that, that I'm definitely working on to say, how do we make sure that we have a more institutional value? For example, influencing the curriculum within the schools, whether it is in your life orientation or whatever particular uh, the subject is, but get it in there and get people talking about it and understanding what is their rights. So that, as I said, as a first step, you need to get yourself registered. Because if you're not registered, by the time elections come around and, and you want to either vote or not vote, you really don't, have, you, have, you have taken that choice away from you because you first need to be on, on the voters' roll. So that is the, the first step is to say, how do we make sure that we, we get into that? Um, that, that for me is, is, is a critical part, getting a, a more institutional basis Secondly, is, is working with, with our organizations out there. I need to find out all these organizations. We have a, a number of, I mean, uh, um, we have a sort of a database. That's sometimes a swear word, no? a database. So you're either on the database or you're not on the database. How do I get, how do I get out there? And, and one of them is to, to be able to engage with uh, these critical dialogues so that we can actually meet more uh, uh, representatives of organizations because I'm not going to know it. Uh, all the organizations out there. But the one is to actually say, how do we meet up and how do we then share that? And how do we empower one another? Um, so that uh, you have a primary as an organization or a, or a, 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 a community organization, you have a primary or a, a, a purpose. But we want to bump, jump onto that primary purpose with you so that as much as we, uh, you are helping us, we're going to help you in, in whatever primary purpose uh, uh, that, that you are serving, whether it's on issues of uh, letting people know what is their rights around housing or whatever the case may be, that's fine. But we need to ultimately be working together and sharing that. Because I also know that, you know, on, on, on this old totem pole of, of interests, sometimes, you know, voting is like down here. People are worried that crime, 
hunger. These are the things that are, that are going to draw people to me, not me coming to tell you about, oh, so you know, your right to vote. Um, and they think, well, what the hell? Um, so, so that is part of my challenge, is, is, un, is getting to grips with that. Um, um, in the in the in the in the, the, the context that the, the past few elections have seen fall offs for the ruling party and the opposition, are the political pressures, political interests, in low voter turnout, and 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 is the pressure on independent organisations like the IEC? Constitutionally independent. Look, look, just can the political yeah, pressures. Yeah. I think, firstly, one, the first thing uh, we, we notice is that the increasing number of participating parties. You know, in last year's election, we had 95 parties contesting just in this province, not in one place, but the number of political parties that are contesting um, has, has almost doubled. So people are seeing an opportunity. Now, whether it's rightly or wrongly, but people are seeing an opportunity. To, to either to represent or for them to, to get into government for whatever reason they want to do. But you are seeing that, and that's why you also see a number of coalitions that are happening, because it's, it's a lot of community-based political parties. You know, they, they're based in strongholds within a particular municipalities. And that is a good part. You've had, we've had close to 85 independents contesting the elections. Unfortunately, not, uh, not one actually won a seat. But that says something again about our psyche. You know, are we, you know, you know, this guy is a good guy, and yet we, we vote for the party. Now, now, that is that is a, 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 um, something which I think that that uh, um, still needs to be explained why people will keep voting, you know, and they're not happy with the candidate, but they're going to vote for the party because that's how they that's how they they do. Whether it is your history, uh, um, that's a tradition. As people say, but that's how the family voted. The fam, that's the party of the family. So I think breaking down those sort of things is going to be important. And part of it is to make sure that people understand that you have a choice. Whether you want to vote for that party or this party, it is your choice. In fact, even if, whether you want to be a candidate. I said there was over 12,000 candidates. Whether you actually want to get your, put your foot down into that sort of water and actually say, I'm going to, I'm going to do something, I'm going to actually stand as a candidate. Um, that in itself is a victory in the sense that because you had uh, 800 odd seats, but you had 12,000 candidates. Now, clearly, 12,000 into 800 doesn't go. But the important is that people were participating because that is the that is the essence of, of our democracy. You participate. You know, may not win, but that is how we strengthen this uh, participation as well. Um, so, so yes, it is it is a, it is a challenge uh, uh, for us uh, going forward. I do not want to get too much into the issues of you know political party strengths or, or not strengths. Um, all I'm saying is that you know the, the, the parties have contested, and 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 you see more and more the response of the voting public to your established parties or to your more your national parties, put it that way, uh, those that are in national parliament. So so yes, there are there's definitely uh, responses uh, coming from from the voting public. Can I ask a follow-up question, but um, not for Michael, but for everyone else? So. I mean, maybe you can also answer this first in terms of the stats, but who are young people voting for? Um, what are the main political parties that young people... I mean, I'm assuming it's the EFF, but I would like <laughs> some stats to back that up. But I mean, and then I guess my question is for, for you guys, how do you feel about that? Um, do you feel a part of that youth voting bloc? I mean, I'm not going to ask what political parties you vote for, um, but yeah. Can I just from... from, from other thing, we don't know who, who young people are voting for. Oh, you don't have those We stats. don't know. No, we oh. can't. We, we don't know how you vote. So the IEC doesn't, but there are stats. But, okay. but there are if, if you, if you, do, if you oh, yeah. go, uh, um, say, for example, HSRC or one of these polling organizations, they can do exit polls after the election and, okay. and find out people how they're voting. But from, definitely from outside, uh, uh, what I can tell you is we know how many uh, um, young people voted because we scan your ID, so we know the oh. age group or, 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 or your gender for that particular matter, but not how of you course, voted. Yes. Um, okay, but yeah, so the point yeah, so is... So there it is, the, 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 the EFF um, picked up the most votes in the 2019 election, you know, and there was there was significant followers to the ANC and the DA. So, and, and in Qatar as well, the Qatar Freedom Party, but it is assumed that the EFF picked up the youth vote that fell away. Uh, and you know, 
So, so that's a fact, you know. So that's a, that's, that's, that's a hint in and of itself, you know, that, 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 that youth participation has the potential to create a seismic political shift, yeah. so to speak. And I think, like, I'm thinking of one specific character that's probably, like, instrumental in that, um, who is, you probably know, Uncle Vinny. <laughs> Uh, you know, so he's, a, he's this 18 year old, 17, 18 year old, but um, what what could I say? He's a presenter. He's, he's just like a cultural figure um, who is also very much part of like South African music scene and like I'm a piano spreading across the world. And Julius like literally like campaigns with that guy and like he like dances in front of the crowd, he, he speaks to the crowd, he, like, I don't know what, if, like, how much influence that has, but I'm assuming it's a lot because he's a cultural figure that people look up to and, like, associate with as a young person. And that's the only political party really doing something I like know, that. That's not true. The ANC uses like AKA, Bunang, Mateba. No, the ANC. <laughs> no, nah, that's even the DA. <laughs> see, yeah. I, I don't belong to a political party, oh, and it's yeah. because of this. You see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's because of this. Because <laughs> as soon as we belong to. Um, and I understand you're quite informed. You've read EFF's manifesto, and a lot of people haven't read uh, EFF's manifesto. And they will probably vote EFF, and then when it comes to how things must roll, they won't like it. They will feel like oh, it's a dictator, but it's n they don't know how the political party is set up. So I don't belong to a political party. I choose not to uh, because I feel like I, I am I am for South Africans. I am not for a certain uh, uh, a group. Uh, as much as my live reality is that black people are still the ones that are suffering, etc. But I don't belong to a political party because I feel like it, it divides us. Um, yeah, that's to your to your to your question. To be fair, though, um, I don't vote according to my political party. Even in in the last, well, I've only voted in two elections, and I've never voted according to my party. I, I look at the candidates, and oftentimes, I mean, in my ward, the EFF candidate was a mess. Um, I knew him personally, and he had gotten the candidateship by like power grabs. I voted for um, a good candidate actually, who was an activist in my community and who had like a very established reputation. So I don't think I don't think belonging to a party means necessarily that you are going to vote for that party. And Jason, to to come back to your point, I think it has more to do with the EFF in tertiary institutions and like really pushing the student command and really like building up provincial structures. I do hear you in terms of like the cultural, um, but I don't think that's the, yeah. I don't think that's the, the main. The main, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, also, I also have a question for anyone like, so what, for the youth who feel, or you know, like has voting very low on the priority list, how would we like, convey or convince, like what would be the argument for like convincing someone to register to vote? It's a difficult question. Um, I had many conversations before the last election where I was trying to get young people to vote, trying to get them to register to vote. And sometimes it feels like you're talking to a wall because honestly, all the, all the things that we've said is the reason that they don't vote, that they don't participate. And how can you tell someone like, no, but um, even though your vote doesn't really matter, um, still do it nonetheless, right? It's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but I would say that I think we need to move away from like this national, um, kind of obsession we have and come back to local government and, um, what's happening in our communities, who are the ward councillors? Because also there's a lot of budget in local government, which we often forget, right? Um, and so I think that is where the work that, that you do, I think is how we actually get people more engaged and interested. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, can I just say also one other thing? Way is also to, 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 to look at the different structures where young people can get involved, whether it's a RCL at the school or, or within their political organisations, youth structure, to get involved with a process of saying, how do you choose and how do you then understand when candidates 
and, and then, you know, their platforms, interrogate them, how, what are they going to do, and then hold them accountable. Um, like the ward committees you talked about, how many people actually attend the ward committee uh, if it's not from that particular councillor's group of, of supporters? And then that opportunity is almost lost because it's a controlled environment. So I think when we look at the other areas where you also have uh, um, these uh, sort of democratic uh, voting processes and say, live it, see how it actually gets it, uh, practice it and see and, and hold people accountable for it, just so that you can with your ward councillor, also hold him or her, uh, um, or they accountable for, for what um, they, 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 they stand for. You're almost, you're almost speaking about participation at its least politicised level, if you, if you want to yeah. put it that way. Where it is party, political, about, yeah, party, party political. Party political level. Um, it's just been brought to my attention that there are some people out in the audience okay. who have comments and questions. So okay. can I open up the, um, the floor? So thank, thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, we have some comments and questions from the audience. So I'm just going to go to one of our first audience members uh, and just um, who has a question for us. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here. I felt that the discussion was very much focused on the IEC, um, but I wanted to hear more about democracy. So I found myself wondering, I, I mean, my first thought was that I hadn't seen them at schools and I do, I have worked in a lot of schools. Um, but I think for me, it stems from our understanding of systemic inequality and how we respond to that. Um, so as a parent of a teenager, I listen to conversations that happen in my home and the children who come to my house and that is obviously um, the conversations they have in their homes and so I'm wondering also I mean the IC is only one part of they are representative of democracy um, maybe but there's so many other stakeholders and I'm wondering what roles do they play in educating? So what roles do political parties play in educating young people? Um, what, how do we get peop, um, parents to educate themselves and their children? And I want to say that I do think that it's people with privilege who have a big role to play in democracy and education around democracy. Because unless we have a lived experience of systemic inequality, a lot of us actually don't care. Thank you so Hello. much. Thank you um, so much. Yeah, let's just take one more sort of input and, and question and, other, and then, then I think we can kind of round up from there. <coughs> Uh, one, I think I've been put on the spot. <laughs> um, I think um, there's, there's quite some good points, you know, a very interesting conversation that's, you know, um, around the table. Um, I, I think just like um, uh, my colleague over there that I feel like because now there's a, a scapegoat, the IEC, um, then, you know, everyone was really like on a tech mode to say the IEC, the IEC. But I think I was really also interested in terms of like, you know, how, how, how do we link the two, youth and democracy? Um, and, you know, what's everyone's thoughts about democracy? And I think the reason why also I think there was some pre-production uh, that was happening here um, where, you know, I think Joyan was, you know, was also engaging about democracy. And uh, before before I can, you know, uh, ask a question also to the IEC, I just want to, you know, share, you know, my my point of view when it comes to democracy in the South African context precisely. Um, one, I believe that, uh, you know, the biggest confusion that we have or the biggest confusion that a post-colonial or post-apartheid South Africa has right now is, you know, democracy masquerading as utopia, a perfect world. 
Um, and I'm saying this because I think pre-94, um, when, you know, the negotiations were, you know, coming to light, saying that now we're moving to a democratic country, which is South Africa, people are getting their freedoms, you know, the freedom to vote or the privilege to vote, whatever the case is when it comes to black people. Um, we all believe that it's going to be magic. I mean, I think it's how it was um, presented to us. We're never told about, you know, uh, things like, you know, transparency when it comes to democracy. We're never told about uh, how do we make our government, you know, accountable to whatever that uh, as a country um, we decide on? And when you speak to uh, speak about democracy, sorry, there are things, you know, such as social contract, um, which a lot of people don't understand those concepts. And I think it then speaks to now how democracy again was presented to the majority of South African citizens, which is the black people. Um, we, uh, that's why even now, uh, most of the conversation, about 80% about it, when we sp speak about democracy, it was always focused on voting, 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 voting. Because I think it, it's that really democracy, it, it boils down to its logic, which is a, a, a system of government uh, by the people as well. I was taught in primary school. A system of government by, by the people and also for the people, right? Um, really boiling down again to the disfigurement of its institution, holding them accountable and all of those things. I know that also, again, there's a lot of, like, you know, critical role players in, in, in the communities, also in the country, NGOs to be precise. I think I'm one person who actually believes in civil society, NGOs, and all of those things to actually, you know, push a narrative forward. What is the IC actually doing? I mean, I know there is uh, Democracy Works, one of the biggest players, I think, you know, that believes um, in democracy in the country. Um, there's a, there's Activate, which is like pro-young people. My vote uh, counts. Sorry? My vote counts. You know, so what is the IC doing in, in terms of like bringing all these critical players into one room? Um, I mean, the first time, I think I actually like the point that you raised, the first time I heard about something it's called an IDP in my community budget and whatnot is when I joined Activate, you know. Um, and I feel like, you know, political education is very much important so that before we can say that democracy does not work, or we need an alternative, or whatever the case is, uh, what are we basing that on? Uh, what other uh, 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 length have we gone to, you know, to explore whether democracy works or it doesn't work? So what is the ICE actually doing to put those big players into one room so that they can, I mean, you said it yourself that uh, um, your job is not to go to how many schools and whatnot, but is to actually work with partners, but what are you doing to work with those partners? And uh, just to, before I, I close off, I just want to also, you know, um, applaud what Cornerstone is really doing, and I think it's what maybe the IC should be doing. Thanks. Any other comments? No, thank you. I think that's okay. all from the floor. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just open it up to the table for anybody to respond to the two, to the, to, to the two people from the floor um, before I make a final comment. Thanks. I can go ahead. It should be my final comment, I think. Uh, I, 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 uh, the first comment, I do think we didn't speak about uh, democracy in, in its fullest lens. Uh, I totally agree. And you bringing up your social contract, which is now uh, part of the democracy. And uh, we didn't unpack it. Like you said, we didn't speak about public participation, which voting is one element, you know, and which is quite true. Uh, but I did mention that I'm pro-democracy for myself because I'm informed in terms of what it consists of and I'm informed of how to navigate. And uh, I'm also an activator, I was a facilitator there. So these things like Activate, which is a youth uh, organization that speaks about toolkits of young people being socially, politically navigating, so understanding. For me, I think when we speak about young people, number one, one wish is one thing. If I have a book, and it's a, I'm not sure if it's the IEC, the Making Local Government Work booklet. You see, if I can take that book and be able to facilitate that thing to people, I'll be happy. Because at the end, we are still humans, we still make decisions, but if I can take that manual, because that manual speaks everything to say this is your rights, and put it into people's mind and head. We've got people protesting for houses, but it's a provincial or national matter but they're, they're burning local government structures and you're like, you're burning a library, but the library does not have to do with, you know, so people are uninformed. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm also pro, you know, you know, protesting, you know, in, in part of democracies that you can actually protest. You know, we have a lot of advocacy ways 
advocacy work, you know, research, you do research, you get informed. So I feel like in South Africa, I, there's this basis that democracy, I think even the world looks at us, they like to experiment to see, can this work here, you know, can, because I feel like we, we, we do have that ground, yes, I'm privileged because I also went to Cornerstone. I have an education. Someone does not have an education. Is that booklet written in his course or in his Zulu? Can I facilitate? So there are these layers, but I do feel I'm a very positive person to say, we have something here. Now, the only thing I feel like is missing, we're not being effective or efficient on doing this. Because the reason we speak to the IEC is because we know decision makers, you're a decision maker, you are there. And hence, we will speak because we're not given the time to speak to you. You know, hence, we will say, okay, I see, I see this. But, and I love what you said that you are bringing institutions. I, 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 I'm pro for that, like, into that room. But we, I personally know, and I'm speaking based on my lived reality, I've worked with lots of Section 9 institutions. <laughs> Invite them, come to, we are going to run clinics in the community. After a certain time, nowhere to be there. You know, and then we come down to a layer of leadership within democracy. The leadership is broken, you can see it. And the leadership we are looking at, the same institutions. I mean, I'm not gonna go into politics right now, but we have the public protector now that has been fired, you know. And if we follow the news, it's the same thing. It's politics, it's not speaking to us, you know. And I, I, I come back, it's your activate, it's your Gamba youth is your equal education, it's your, it, these groups that are there that can work. You know, we have groups in Menenberg, Hanover Park, Kukule, to Cape Flats. They all have organizations or young people that are, can. We're not given the power. We do have the influence, we do have the power to influence, but we're not sitting in those tables. We need to sit in those tables. And then lastly, regarding education and where we're at, just wrapping up to what you are saying, we are online. I feel like people are online. We have a podcast, which is called Podcast and Chill. So it's a podcast that speaks silly things, né? but this time they say we're not political. They brought political, a political person there. You should have seen the conversations in the comment section in these young people. And that podcast is not, it's not political, they, but the young people were speaking now. So again, they're online. You know all of these things, yeah. Thank you. I'm done. So our time is up. Very yeah, so short, very short. Very, short. very, very short. Okay. Um, I'll make a very short comment. And just coming back to what you said, you know, about in 1994, it's like, oh, like democracy just turned on like a like a light switch. And I think um, we often maybe don't think about the fact that the end of apartheid did not mean the undoing of apartheid. Um, and I'm. I think I'm probably the most cynical person here about democracy and I, I philosophically I don't know if I believe in it but what I will say is I think in South Africa we need to move beyond this point of whether we have democracy or not and rather move to a point where how are we going to build this democracy because I don't think democracy is just something that is there and but we need to think of the ways practically how are we going to it's going to take block by block um so how do we do that? So, yeah. Thank you, Jordan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw this to a close and uh, just, you know, slightly vary from the, the comments that, that we were narrowly focused. Yes, we focused on the young, the youth vote quite narrowly, but I think this conversation brought out a lot more. I think it brought out, this conversation is about citizenship and the state and about what it means to be a citizen, um, you know, what, what our vision is are, are, are of the state, what the agencies are that are going to, you know, address these issues, these critical issues which we addressed here. Um, how are we going to carry that? How are we going to find a shared vision? How are we going to carry it forward um, to the kind of state we, 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 we want to see? So, so thank you, everybody. So, so in, in other words, this is a conversation like this is a beginning because there are steps, you know, to, to identify uh, strategies, agencies that need to be brought together, conversations that need to be had. Um, Michael? We are the IEC, we are accountable, we are accountable to you and to answer the questions that you raise. So by all means, um, I'm also hoping that, as you said, that this is a much broader thing that 
you know, yes, we are here now, but we, it's going to hopefully be a series of these engagements so that we can unpack more some of these, the different uh, aspects of this tapestry of our democracy, which is, which is hard work. Our democracy is hard work to, to keep up and maintain. And, and, and I mean, from our side, we, we definitely will commit to, to work with whoever is willing to work with us as well. We, we're hoping to create our, 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 you know, the number of organizations that we engage with uh, to broaden those and to bring them all aboard and, and to have different ways in which we can actually use the footprint that is there really. Um, and, and sometimes let's have the, the difficult conversations. I mean, that is why uh, I'm here, uh, to have those difficult conversations. And that's why you are there also to ask those uh, uh, difficult uh, questions of me uh, as, as a state institution that is, that is there to, to, to also um, entrench our democracy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.